George Hussey, Dr. 914 from Automobile Atlanta, and today we're going to do a tour of a 914 1.7 engine. Many, many times I've been asked about vacuum line routing and electrical wiring connections. So today we're going to specifically go over that along with serial numbers, where the boots and the plugs go, color of injectors, general different coloring of the sheet metal components, and years of the engine. So we'll start off by looking at this engine in general. My first impression would be that this has a plastic round air cleaner that would immediately tell me that it's a 7317. 73 was the only year with a plastic air cleaner. The other one said it's had a steel one. Now we all dream of having a pristine, beautiful, like brand new engine that they have in the original factory for sure, but Let's face the facts, these things are 50 years old now and that's not going to happen, but we can get pretty close. Someone has dolled this engine up just a bit and did some nice paint work, but it still has issues and we're going to go over those right now. So I'm going to begin with vacuum line routing. Some of these lines are not connected and I'll show you which ones they are and others may be connected improperly. That's why we chose just a random engine. So I've freed the wing nut and I freed the intake boot for the air cleaner and notice the first vacuum line here connects to the breather system. This breathes the vapor from the heads caused by crankcase pressure from the left front of the head and the right rear of the head fittings into a collector and a backfire valve, they call it, and, and into the air cleaner. And these are new vacuum lines, continental vacuum lines, so they're a little hard to get off. The original vacuum lines were multicolored, but Continental has changed them into basically one color. The obviously uh, exception to the basic is the green uh, D-cell vacuum line, D-cell, and also vacuum retard. The vacuum line here that was not connected goes to the front charcoal canister and it is evacuated uh, through the expansion tank on the front of the gas tank. That's why it's not connected now. When the car gets its engine, then we connect this. Next, we're going to talk about the PCV valve. This relieves the crankcase pressure when it gets too excessive, such as you have a bad pressure sensor and it starts to dilute the uh, oil and it blows by the rings. Then you get excessive pressure and it blows it into the intake right here through this PCV valve. The next one is the pressure sensor. This is the air pressure sensor which feels the vacuum and this is actually mounted on the body and adjusts the duration of injection via through the control unit which is not connected right here. Then next we have the auxiliary air valve. I've taken this loose. You can see the auxiliary air valve connects directly to the air intake boot and then directly to the plenum. This actually causes a vacuum leak when the car is cold to add more air so that with more air and more fuel the mixture is richer so it warms up a lot easier and runs all right when it is cold. Next we have the distributor. I've pulled this distributor out here to show you that the distributor vacuum advance has two lines. The one coming out of the side, the fat, the larger one, is for the retard, the vacuum retard. This actually pulls the timing down to zero. And the one sticking up in the air is for the vacuum advance. And when the distributor is in, the retard is in the front and the, uh, the advance is in the rear. Also, on the throttle body, the retard is in the front and the advance is in the rear. The advance is a 3.5 line and the retard is a 4.5 line. So it's easy, front to front, rear to rear, can't go wrong. Also, one of the mechanics capped these off is not to get debris in the plenum box. But these two lines here are for the D-cell valve, we call it. It lets the idle down more slowly so that unburned gas doesn't go through the exhaust. It's more of a pollution control device, but it also lets the idle not bump all the way down and sometimes conk out the car. That's what these two lines are. The D-cell valve is stacked on pneumatic, the acceleration valve is stacked on top of the pressure sensor with a small fitting facing forward. The side 
larger fitting going into the air cleaner and then the rear one uh, going to the back vacuum source. There are two wiring harnesses on every original factory engine. One is called the ignition wiring harness and the other the control unit harness. I'm going to start with the ignition wiring harness. It originates from the relay board which is in the left front of the engine compartment. You can see this 14, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I always, I always forget this, uh, 12 prong plug, 14 in the front, coming from the front of the car, 12 in the rear, and this is the ignition wiring harness, which besides going to the ignition also goes back here to the starter solenoid, the yellow lead we talk about all the time, and actually the backup lights, and these have two bullets that are supposed to be on them that often break off to plug into the backup light. And then the harness goes along the back of the engine, makes a dramatic right turn, and goes to the distributor, which is right here that I pulled out. And the distributor has, besides a condenser being attached, one wire, which is the green condenser wire, that goes to the negative or one side of the coil and it's clearly marked. It's clearly marked usually on the original Bosch coils. This is a uh, aftermarket. It's, it's marked one. One always on Porsche means the ground lead. So if you see a one anywhere or a 31, that's a ground lead. The other side of the coil, the 15 side, which is positive, has the main ignition wire going to it, which when the key is turned on has power all the time. Oftentimes when you're working on your car, if you leave the key on, it has power going here all the time. And if the points are in the wrong position, like say just a little bit like that, it'll cause a spark and burn the points out. And then you wonder why after playing the radio, the car doesn't start. Don't leave the ignition key on to play the radio because the points could burn out. The other side of this coil, back to the one side, you can hardly see it, but it's here, is a smaller black with purple striped wire. That is for the tachometer. Oftentimes, again, people leave the uh, key on and the points are not working, so they're about closed and they will burn out the condenser wire and go to the tack and burn the tack wire. So you really want to avoid keeping the key on when uh, you are playing the radio when the car is not running. Down in the hole here is the oil pressure switch. It is a green with black wire, and notice it has a boot around it. The 914 air-cooled engine needs every boot on it it can, so it, all the air that comes to cool the engine goes and cools the engine, doesn't blow out of holes anywhere. Then we have the final wire here, which is actually in the ignition harness. It is <coughs> right here. This is the white wire for the auxiliary air valve. As it compares to the white wire for the thermo time switch, they're in the same position, so you certainly don't want to mistake them or you could have a big problem. The auxiliary air valve lead, <coughs> excuse me, plugs into the red wire from the auxiliary air valve, and this is powered when the car is running, not when the key is on. This device, since it has air coming from the plenum into the air cleaner, and that's how it works, often gets the blow-by and the condensation from the cold engine. And what's inside of here is like a revolving door. So the condensation keeps going in, going in over the years, and it rusts the door shut. And then you either have a situation where the door is closed or the door is open. If it's open, it's fine when it's cold. When it heats up, it idles too high. If it's closed, then it's like hell when you're trying to get the car to run when it's cold, but after it heats up, it's fine. So very important to check this and periodically maybe spray a little bit of WD-40 in there to keep the, the door lubricated. Next, we're gonna review the control unit harness. The control unit harness, like the ignition harness, begins at the relay board here, four prong plug-in and roots to the back of the engine and then splits right here 
part of it going to the front where the cold start valve is and up underneath that the thermo time switch which you can see here we had talked in the previous about the thermo time switch and auxiliary air valve white wires don't confuse them the thermo time switch triggers the auxiliary air valve at 40 degrees or colder to inject extra gasoline to start the car only. This only works on the cranking circuit, not after the car is running, and they rarely fail. Then we have the, the air temperature sensor lead right here. This senses in cooling air and adjusts the mixture accordingly. We have all of the ground leads, and these are always a source of problems, so it's very important to make sure these are tight. Notice this one is a little bit loose. It is amazing how ground leads cause problems all the time and nobody pays attention to them. These are the grounds for the main control unit harness and both of the injectors. The injectors are grounded side to side. So these two injectors are grounded here and these two injectors are grounded here. And then the control unit continues forward to the trigger points which are in the bottom of the distributor. And these are fired diagonally trigger points lead. When the trigger points get dirty, you'll notice it breaks up at high idle, excuse me, at high RPMs, and you wonder why uh, after replacing the points it's still doing it while well, the trigger points are dirty. And at this date, these new trigger points are not available, so it's very important to take these out and clean them. And then the harness roots over to here, and notice the critical part right here is the head temperature sensor. It actually goes into the sheet metal and it's a wire wound resistor that senses the temperature and adjusts the mixture accordingly. It starts out at 2750 ohms at 40 degrees and ends up at about 50 ohms residual when it's fully warm. This is a critical failure. It sometimes fails to where it thinks the engine is cold and and enriches the duration of injection so much the engine floods out and you come to a stop and wonder why it won't start because it's flooded and then you wait a while and then it starts and you drive off. That's because this head temperature sensor has failed. In the opposite extreme, you can't start your car when it's cold. The, the uh, cold start valve may work and it starts and dies, starts and dies, starts and dies. You think, my God, I'm going to can this thing and buy a Boxster. But all it is is the head temperature sensor not giving enough resistance to enrich in the mixture. The next thing we have are the four injectors. The beige boots are supposed to be to the front. The black ones are supposed to be to the rear. Since the injectors fire, fire diagonally, that'll keep this doing what it's supposed to do if you have them plugged in correctly. And notice we have yellow topped injectors. Yellow topped injectors are 1.7 only. People have substituted 3.11 black ones, which work, but they are not exactly matched to the engine. So always make sure you have yellow topped injectors in your car. And then we come over to the pressure sensor. This senses the vacuum and the diaphragm in here uh, triggers the control unit to adjust the mixture also. I'm not getting into the specifics. I could, but I'm not. So we have the plug here, four prong. And what usually happens with these is the leads in the plug back back. And then you don't realize that one's not making connection. And finally, we go over to the control unit itself, which hangs in the front of the battery stand like this, and it has a silver cover off of it. Gray, I've taken that off. A lot of people don't think that they can unplug this, but this control unit unplugs right here. This piece, if made today, would be about the size of my pinky, maybe, instead of this barbaric thing with transistors in it. But it did its job back then, and it did it well, and it was one of the first cars to have fuel injection. The top knob here, this is idle adjustment only. It has nothing to do with the running of the car, just idle enrichment. In fact, the early 914s didn't even have one because Porsche thought, Porsche Volkswagen, that we've got our mixture perfect. We don't need to adjust it. Finally, I want to talk about the engine in general, starting with the ID number. The 17 and 18 models have the engine ID number at an angle at the right back of the block. And as you can see right here, this one starts EA. EA is a 7317 engine specifically. Right here, if this had 
EB or EC, it would be a 1.8, and if it had WO, it would be an earlier 1.7. The intake runners are from the factory painted with zinc paint. It's a powdery paint to avoid rust. So these are the correct color for the intakes. The original intake boots were smaller than these, but they've been discontinued. Hence, we have put clamps on them. These clamps were not factory correct. The sheet metal is always painted semi-gloss, not gloss, not flat, but semi-gloss. You can see the 1.7 air cleaner stand with a four, three rubber buffers so that it won't squeak and rub. The timing hole plug is right here. This is where we check the timing. The engine fan, as you can see with the blades, when you're turning this over, you can grab it like this and turn the engine over to put it on top dead center if you have to. You can see even with the spark plugs in, it's fairly easy to turn. This is the alternator, the alternator belt. You can see the deflection just about right. Nobody ever remembers because it's hidden and then the alternator breaks out of the blue and they wonder why. These are the two access plugs to adjust the alternator when you put a new belt on. These right here and right over here are called the J-pipes. This is where the auxiliary blower blows extra air into the heat exchangers to supplement the blow forward of heat when you're at an idle. Once you get going, this impeller is perfectly good enough to blow plenty of heat forward, but in on idle, this is what supplements the heat. In 73, they've changed the heater blower motor. They only had one hose here, and on the other side, they actually capped it off. It was only until early 75, and then they reinstated both heater blower motor hoses. You can look here, it looks like something is missing. Well, there is something missing. This is where somebody originally mounted an air conditioning compressor at the dealership when this car was sold new. And it's been taken off and you can see the butchery here. Somebody got a cutter and just cut the sheet metal just enough to fit the compressor on, but that's how they did it. A lot of these installations were done beautifully. Others were sort of hacked like this one is. The solution is to buy a new piece here and a new piece here. Right here is where the accelerator cable used to come up into the engine compartment. Now it's just misrooted over the front to connect it because there's no, with the air conditioning compressor here, there's no place for it to go. The boots, we have a boot. We had mentioned the oil pressure switch boot down in here. We have a boot for the head temperature sensor here. We have a boot for the starter harness right here. And this goes up to the battery. We have a boot for the alternator plug over here. We have boots here in the back for the ignition harness to go through. And the alternator lead to go through. And of course we have spark plug boots. The 1.7 can be designated from the 2 liter because the 1.7 spark plugs go in from the top and the two liter spark plugs go in from the side. That's an instant way. Many people call and say, I have a two liter. Well, they go and they look and the spark plugs go in from the top. They don't have a two liter. And then finally, the four bolt intake. The two liter has a three bolt, one, one in the middle and one on the outside. If you look at this intake, it's clearly four bolt. That means it's either one seven or one eight, but we've already determined that this is a 73 1.7. The final thing is the thermostat bellows, which is extremely important to engine cooling and engine warm-up. We want the engine to warm up as quickly as possible so we don't have a lot of condensation in it, which wears the engine out, and the engine's most efficient warmed up. This thermostat bellows is up underneath, and it pulls the flap shut to not let air go over the oil cooler and to not let air go over this cylinder. When it's open, this tab will stand straight up. The flap on this side will go directly over the oil cooler, split so that half of the air goes over the cylinder, the other hair, half of the air is forced through the oil cooler, and then this one is wide up, you can't see them, and it lets the air go over the cylinders. If you remove these, there will be no air forced into the oil cooler and the engine will cook. People think they take the flaps off 
and it's going to cool. It's not going to cool at all. It's going to cook. So again, critically important to have the thermostat bellows working properly. Finally, the throttle body. There is a spring. People have asked me where the spring connects. And you can see the little hole right here. This is the spring for the throttle return. It goes right there. It goes right back to here so that it keeps that. If the spring is not on there and you let go of the throttle, it could just flop and you could have the engine revving to holy hell before you know it. Throttle body, we talked about the vacuum advance, the vacuum retard, and this is the <clears throat> idle screw to get the idle correctly done. After you set the dwell, after you set the timing, then you can set the idle at 950. So thank you very much for listening to our video and please keep in mind here at Automobile Atlanta we're always open for advice so don't hesitate ever to call us and ask. We've been in the business for 43 years now and I always say that if we don't have the 914 answer, no one does. Thank you again for listening.